is. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us on our uh, March IARC Salon. Um, we ask to double check that you are muted uh, while the presenters are sharing their discussions. Um, we do ask questions, wait for, for the questions until the end, but if you would like to type your question in the chat as the discussions are ongoing, please feel free to do so and we will read them off at the end. Um, you are also welcome to unmute yourselves and ask your own questions uh, at the appropriate time. Um, if you join by phone, uh, we just ask that again, you double check that you are muted. Um, and if you don't know how to mute yourself, please press star six, that should do it for most phones. Um, but we can hear you if you're not muted on your phone um, and it can be distracting. Um, again, any questions, just enter them into the chat. Um, the, the salon is being recorded and will be available uh, within a day or two on the IARC website. And I think I have covered most of that. So I will pass it over to Nicholas uh, for our introductions. Cool. Thank you, Cecilia. And uh, Dr. Hebert, I just want to let you know, uh, I still haven't gotten anything. So, and you're our first speaker. So just um, encouraging you to <laughs> throw that our way as soon as you have the chance. Um, so everybody, uh, it's really great to have you all with us today. Welcome to our second to last IARC Salon of the 2021 uh, 2020 to 2021 academic school year, which has been one for the record books. Um, I hope everybody here is staying healthy, um, that you're getting vaccinated as soon as possible, and that you're all looking forward to a warm and welcoming spring uh, back out in the in the great outdoors. Um, so my name is Nicholas Parlato. I'm a first year interdisciplinary PhD student um, and a research assistant at the Center for Arctic Policy Studies. Um, and I'm gonna be our moderator for today. Um, and my co-host, uh, Cecilia Boris-Striegel will be assisting with questions and, and assorted other technical issues as we go along. So we've got a really excellent panel today to talk about a topic that is very much in the headlines and on the minds of about everybody working in the Arctic right now, which is infrastructure. Uh, Northern re regions are frequently described as being infrastructure poor with scattered aging and inefficient service systems. Um, these types of things are cited as one of the critical challenges for communities and governments in recent years. Um, and while this characterization fails to acknowledge the once plentiful natural and social infrastructures that have sustained Arctic communities for generations, it does speak to changing needs in a globalizing and warming world. So of particular interest to today's panelists uh, and many in the Arctic science community is the relationship between melting permafrost and hard infrastructures roads, housing, industrial buildings, piping, power delivery systems. These will all require novel approaches to design, materials, and maintenance in order to ensure resilience in Arctic settlements into the future. So to discuss some of these challenges and solutions to these issues, we welcome three distinguished panelists. First, we have uh, Dr. Jack Hebert uh, of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the founder of the CCHRC, the Cold Climate Housing uh, Research Center. Uh, we have Dr. Aaron Dodson, the UAA Vice Chancellor for Research and Professor of Civil Engineering. And we have Billy Connor, uh, Director of the Arctic Infrastructure Development Center, which I recently learned uh, is a very young organization. And so I'm excited to hear uh, what, the, what directions they're taking and what kind of projects uh, are already under their belt. So to begin with today's presentations, I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Hebert and I'm gonna check my email and lo and behold, I have his presentation. So I'm going to open that up right now, and it will it it must download. This is a this is a a data rich presentation. This is a multi megabyte. Here we go. Okay, Dr. Hebert, are you are you ready? I'm I'm ready. If you can hear me, can you hear me, Nicholas? I can, loud and clear. Is, is the uh, image, Good. is the presentation visible to everybody? That is the one, yep. You might wanna do full screen on it. Yeah, that's that's a different question here. I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to just <laughs> Well, that's all good. I mean, I can certainly Certainly start with what we got, Nicholas, if you don't mind being in control of the the changing of the slides, that would be great. Awesome. They're not too many and not too complicated, but thank you all for having me. I was just on a presentation with, with uh, Dr. Connor, Billy Connor, 
uh, and I know Aaron Dotson, so you've got a great group today. Um, I'm focusing a little bit rather than on specific uh, specifics dealing with climate change, like foundations and and that those kinds of pieces. I'm I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we're going to get there because we we really have a great a great challenge here. And uh, the next slide, thank you. I think most of you are familiar, I hope, with the Coal Climate Housing Research Center. Uh, we were founded a little over 20 years ago. We're on the campus of the University of Alaska. And uh, let's see, I just lost, lost you. Hang on. This is not real pleasant what I'm dealing with here. Um, Anyway, it's a lead platinum building built on degrading permafrost and considered at this latitude to be the most energy efficient building in the world. Next slide. These are the areas of our work. Uh, many uh, of the folks at the university have worked with us and worked with us in the in the past on some of our projects. This is uh, typical of the kind of work we do in one of our labs. Uh, this is an environmental chamber that will actually go down to minus 40. Primarily for, at this point, we're testing air source heat pumps. So it's it's science stuff. And uh, and it's important to have that to complement our applied researches, which is really what we are. Next, please. And that's all about demonstration and deployment. Um, if we can't If we can't show it, if people can't see it and feel it, uh, are we really making progress or are we just doing studies on a shelf? So this is very much applied research. And that is really shown in our Sustainable Northern Communities program. Uh, and this involves a process. And I think that some of our successes on this can be, be shared in the work that each of you do. Next, thanks. Uh, you again may be very familiar with NREL. We just developed this formal partnership with NREL last year. Uh, it brings the strength of, of the NREL community into the work that we do. So that includes um, everything from what you see here, uh, but the partnership that, that will expand our mission and make us uh, much more effective and broader. Next slide. The creativity of the North is the real key. Well, here's a little more on NREL. I'm sorry about you having to guide this thing. Um, the, in, in a holistic look at the built environment, all systems and all pieces of it have to be considered. Uh, we bring to NREL the piece of the North and the focus on adapting to this climatic wave that we're dealing with um, globally and particularly here in the far north that, that each of you uh, in your work and interests certainly is at the front of your plate. Next, Nicholas, thanks. The creativity of the north is, is something we need to be proud of. Uh, the, most, the most creative and adaptive people uh, are the root of who we are here. And those are the first people of Alaska. Uh, they found this place to be a, a place of opportunity and abundance. Uh, and 20,000 or 30,000 years later, they're still here. On the other hand, the most restless people in the world came here, the ones that were totally out of the box and, uh, and dealt with this new life in this new place with the creativity that they brought from their homelands uh, and their involvement with making a life here. Next. It's changing and it's changing fast. Uh, it's changing faster than we are. Uh, we are going to have to be very creative to find solutions. Uh, adaptation is going to be the key. We talked about that with a class this morning, Billy and I. Um, we're going to have to be adaptive. We're gonna to have to work together if we're gonna find the way. And the approach needs to be inclusive. 
we need to understand what's going on and we need to look for look towards solutions we're not really ever going to get there as things change we're going to have to constantly adjust our answers and and not assume an arrogance that we know we have certainly seen many failures due to that arrogance and due to the siloing of the different professions we've got to work together on this next please The physical environment's changing. Of course, the economic environment's changing. Next. The cultural environment is changing. We are mixed people now. Uh, many of our families are both part of the indigenous world and part of the, the world that our European or Asian ancestors came from. Uh, and the political environment, we don't even want to start talking about that right now, but it's, uh, it's a minefield. Uh, again, collaboration and working together is the only way forward uh, to a bright future. Next. I really do believe that we all need to draw on indigenous wisdom. And that's the wisdom of our ancestors. I, I tell my first Alaskan friends that when they came over here and made a life in this beautiful land, my people were living in caves in France. So really how different are we? But those of us from a European centric world are very separated from that connection to indigenous wisdom that is still much a part of the first Alaskans lives. So water, food and shelter are the key. We've got to understand that without that, we don't move forward. Next. And it's responsibility. I mean, that's we've we've got to respect each other. I love the Anupiaq, the Inuit values, and and this is true of all indigenous values. It begins with community, then family, then self. Think about that. As as Europeans or or recent arrivals, it's it's all about me. Well, it's not. It's really all about us about the community, my family, and if there's some room, myself. That's how we'll find solutions next. The need is huge in our world, in housing, it's huge. Uh, these, these statistics are not happy ones. Uh, this is from our housing needs assessment for the state of Alaska. 74% of the homes are considered drafty, but that's drafty is just an inconvenience. But when you start looking at mold and structural failure, this little girl in the right hand corner below, her house was literally rotting around her. In this community that we worked in, Quinnahawk, you could stuff a, a number two pencil through that grade beam. It's so rotten and that's bad building science. That's Western ways of building totally inappropriate for place. Next. Uh, what we learn here, what we learn in this place in Alaska has global implications. Uh, our solutions can be shared with the world and it's acute here. It's not something we can just think about. It's something we have to do something about. Next. So 21st century technology, next slide. And indigenous wisdom. That combination of the truths we know about survival combined with the technologies and the science and what we're learning can lead us forward in a positive way. Next. So um, examples of this are in our work in Alaska. These are some of the communities that we've worked in in um, demonstration projects, working with the people, just some of them. Next. This is an example of one that that little girl in that picture is from Quinnahawk. Uh, 40%, 35 to 40% of the homes in that community were at catastrophic structural failure. Uh, a private uh, engineering firm third party that we brought in to look at the village said, uh, 
if I were going to get through, we're standing in one of those homes that's deteriorating. He says, if I wanted to get through this winter, I would put a tent in the living room and I would burn the rest of the house to stay warm. Uh, it's surprising that they haven't fallen down yet, that there haven't been a major catastrophe in that community. So next slide. We listened, we listened to the people in a collaborative way, bringing their wisdom and understanding of place into the design of their homes. This is the shape Quinnahawk came up with the most practical shape for that place with high high velocity winds from all directions, issues related to drifting, uh, of course, problems with staying warm. This shape is a practical shape. It's a warm shape. It works well and it's strong and, and is very functional. So a community driven design, next. And that means a, a warm coat, a warm coat with no seams that are sewn through, a warm coat that is complete all the way around the building. So careful attention to thermal bridging, a high, uh, a very compact, high R value insulation that's easily transportable. Everything for this home had to be flown in by plane. Next. and constructability. Each section of this home could be built in a 20 by 20 room in the winter and then assembled in the summer. So in the winter, you build the pieces. In the summer, you put it together. And all of this, all the materials for this building, including the insulation, one DC6 for this house. Very light, very compact, and something that could be built locally. Next. So instruction of local workforce so they can do it themselves to, to help the economy, to get a sense of ownership by the people, to develop skills uh, that works for their lifestyle and the way they live. And uh, again, the, the local workforce informing us really of, of a work plan. Certain times of the year, it's times to fish or it's time to hunt. And other times of the year are the time to build. So we worked with them on developing these, these buildings in this community. Next. And this is, this is the kind of result we got. Now there have been uh, another, another eight of these homes built in this community by the people. 130 gallons of fuel oil. And that's been kind of the average for all these homes that we've done. 80% less fuel consumption than the homes they were living in, at least. Good indoor air quality, fast build, light materials, good price and durable. Next. New talks, another community we've been working with. You can see New Talk in the in the middle of the picture up to the up to the right. How vulnerable does this community look? Well it's it's going away. So we're working on a full relocation of this community. So how do we do that? Next picture. And Billy can talk about infrastructure and the failure of infrastructure in a community like this. It, it, it's, it's unsustainable. You can't keep it going. The ground is literally falling away beneath you and it's turning into water. So you've got to move. So how do we do that? Next slide. So we get innovative in what we build. Again, light and warm, but let's put it on a foundation that can be skidded to a new location. Our original idea for this, this demonstration home in Newtok was to build it in Newtok and then pull it across the ice to the new location in Muktovic, 10 miles across the ice to the, to the new location of what will become and is becoming their village now. So next slide. So this is what that foundation looks like. Uh, using a triadetic foundation that's very, very stiff with skids that can be fully adjusted. So this was the first home in Muktovic. Next slide. It also include, included water and wastewater in the system because there's no infrastructure there yet. And we developed with uh, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and a local manufacturer, Bob Sagonis here with LifeWater, to come up with a system, a drying toilet that dries the human solids, 
uh, separating elements so that the urine and gray water go into a, into a, uh, uh, a leach pit outside the home or even on the ground. And water delivered to a gravity flow clean uh, water tank that provides potable water and water for washing. Not the ideal system, but a whole lot better than a honey bucket and a, a honey bucket and a slop bucket. Next. The other piece, of course, has got to be good indoor air. So we developed a system we call Breathe, where you can't separate. You see that H E A T in the middle of the name Breathe. You can't separate the heat from good air and health. So if you've got heat, you've got a healthy environment. It's taken care of that way. It's maintained well. A simple system that is now really all over rural Alaska and being embraced. Next. That's just a picture of the breeze and what it looks like. This uh, all, all off the shelf materials uh, providing warm, healthy air throughout the house. Now, the BTU requirements for these homes are very, very small. We've had difficulty getting a small enough unit to heat them. In fact, our original ones were heated by a long haul truck rig heater. Uh, so a truck cab on a long haul truck rig heating a 1200 square foot house because of its energy efficiency. Next. So this is the, the project over there now in Muktarvik on the other side. Uh, I believe right now there are 30 homes. There is a, a, a temporary school and a community building that's being built and the people of New Talk are moving there. Next. So practical home, not a big architectural statement, but warm and cozy and functional. Again, designed with the people of the place, listening. Next. Um, this holistic approach to sustainable northern communities is essential. Really a holistic approach to whatever we do at this time in the history of our species is important. We need to look at as many elements we, as we can. We need to see how each of them complements the other and move towards sustainable communities, thriving, healthy communities. Next. This is, what, this is what we're having to deal with in rural Alaska. The, the vulnerability of these communities is astounding. But the vulnerability of all communities is of concern, whether it's Anchorage or Shishmaref. We've got to learn how to live on this planet in a way that sustains us in the midst of dramatic climate change. Next. So, that was hopefully not too long, Nicholas. And uh, I think when we're all done, there'll hopefully be time for some questions. Um, but thank you all so much for putting up with the awkwardness of this little presentation. Thank you, Nicholas. Dr. Hebert, hardly awkward. I, I think that was a really powerful presentation and I appreciate the values that you bring to it. And also the engineering solutions are really, you know, they're inspiring. So. Um, I think the work, you know, you you well know that the work that you're doing is is incredibly vital. And I think we're all, um, you know, excited to see these things actually get financed and ramped up and go to start, you know, changing, changing our Arctic communities and uh, making things, you know, making life easier and rather than the way it's been. So thank you very much. Um, Dr. Dotson, are you are you prepared? Yep, I'm, I'm good to go. So I'll, I'll chat a little while and then I'll maybe show a couple pictures that I have here through sharing screen. Um, I oftentimes find that sometimes uh, we sit and watch all these presentations on Zoom and we actually never see the people we participate in uh, on Zoom. So I, I try to, to change it up here a little bit. Um, so for me, uh, I grew up in the desert Southwest. I grew up about a hundred miles from Mexico, uh, which means that up here was a notable shock. Um, I'm a water and wastewater person. And in reality, the cool part about this is that there was no water in the Southern Arizona half the year. Generally speaking, there's no water in Alaska for half the year too. It's just the other half of the year. And it, it tends to be there. It's just the wrong phase, right? And so, when I think about what we need to consider about infrastructure here in the north, not only in Alaska, but far beyond, 
across the circumpolar north and in a variety of other just cold climate uh, regions around the U.S. or around the world is it, it's more than just adapting to uh, what we know and and our engineering tools that predominantly are, are generated in warmer climates. It's actually embracing our skill set that we have here in the north and we utilize that skill set to achieve. Uh, and I think that we know that because the way that the change in climate affects us is not equal across our infrastructure needs. I think Jack did a great example of sharing the history and the, and the people and, and how people adapt uh, to their surroundings, as well as how we now are piece by piece adapting to um, more water being present all year round, uh, permafrost melting that causes the ground not to be structurally stable. And, and so what do we design for as engineers? Uh, and, and how do we design it in a way that is one, the people that live where they are choosing to live want to continue to live there, if that's their choice. And, and how do we bring the knowledge set that, that is learned in the North and learned in places with cold regions to bear here, even though it's a much smaller pool of us that do that work? So when we think about the, the, the infrastructure that Jack showed the evolution of, and even now how Jack is building new infrastructure, the question always comes up, do we repair, do we modify, do we replace it? And depending on what that choice is, what is the community engagement in those activities? Is that what the community wants? Do they have the capacity to do it? Do they have the tools, the equipment, the means to, to sustain that into the future? I think all of those things have to be addressed before you, you make a decision on, on the directionality you go. Uh, and I think that when we think about this in replacement, do you replace it with something conventional or do you replace it with something innovative from another climate? Do we innovate our own or do we create the next new rocket ship that we all want that is the dream of the future? I think that's a place where we have a, a potential to be here in Alaska because we are on the precipice of most of this climate change. And we have the opportunity to be the leader in, in a number of these things. And I think above all else, and, and Jack brought this very, very clearly, is local knowledge, experience, and culture is huge. If you ignore that, no matter what you do, it will fail. And I think the example of the past system is incredible um, on that perspective. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and share a couple things here as we go through this and, and just highlight, like, I got to do part of my uh, sabbatical working on the past system. Jack showed the original past system and, you know, that was installed in Kivalina and it worked pretty well. Um, there were some problems with it and ANTHC listened to those problems and in, in this picture, you can actually see some modifications that were made to the one. I know it's not, you don't have this in your head probably the same way I do, but the toilet that Jack showed that was a, uh, a it is a urine diverting uh, drying toilet, um, sep solid separating toilet. We rebuilt it and, and Bob Sagonis and, and I and, Jack, uh, and John Warren and Jack and others all brainstormed a variety of different ways to do this. But this toilet and the urinal that's in the screen here, those two things are kind of Alaskanized. They're made much stronger than the commercial product that was available. It didn't have the movable parts that could break. It when it failed because something froze, it could be shifted into a mode to operate as a honey bucket. It had these things aware with awareness of the climate that we have here and the possible places of uh, failure. Now, I really enjoyed working on this project. It, 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 it was very down to earth. And I think the reason I enjoyed it so much is I was one of uh, the teams that worked on the Alaska Water Sewer Challenge. The challenge was is to essentially bring Western water utilities 
to the communities in rural Alaska that didn't have it in a way that didn't involve pipes. Um, and the reason they, we didn't want to involve pipes is again, poor, poor ground, poor infrastructure on the ground. Pipes are long pieces of linear infrastructure. Unstable ground does not bode well to that, both on the water and sewer side. And so we did a lot of work here to try to work with our communities, come up with the, I would say we're designing the rocket ship here. And we designed this idea that, that you have your house and we're gonna create you an on-site treatment system for all your needs to, attest, to attend to what you in the community determined was important. If we're not gonna have water delivered to our house, I don't wanna be carrying water around a long time. I don't want to have a, a, a chemical disinfectant that I can smell or taste. Uh, I, I want to be able to access it myself and have opportunities to repair it and learn from that. And so we took all those ideas and, and our team built, built something. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying something in a rocket ship for a reason, because this thing is super duper fancy. It uses a lot of hardware. Um, it, we went through multiple iterations. Uh, we created a system that does exactly what people want. It is inexpensive to run because the state was going to buy it. People don't have to carry very much water in. In fact, uh, oops, uh, to Vetney here in this picture, this, these two buckets of water is the amount of wastewater this house produces per week for a household of four. And this is how much water you have to bring home. In everywhere in rural Alaska and in our cities, in the summer, you can collect more than 10 gallons of rainwater a week. Uh, and so this minimizes and it addresses those needs. But I still stand by, we built a rocket ship. This is not a sustainable solution, but it, it, and, and, but it helps us learn. And I think this is where Jack identified that he's doing some crazy science-y things. I think there's people and parts of this world that we have to push the envelope of these crazy science-y things to ensure that we're going to make a difference in people's homes and in their lives and, and enable that people can still live in, in rural Alaska. And one of the other pieces that came along with this is that I think is really important is how we use our infrastructure. And I'm a water guy, so I'm gonna focus a little bit on water. Hopefully I'm, I'm excited to hear Billy talks about some of the roads and, and transportation infrastructure. But to me, when the state pitched this project, they said people are need a minimum of 15 gallons of water per day per person. Even though we know in, in communities without running water that people use as low as two gallons per person per day. I question that number. And I question that number throughout the study that we worked on with them. And I even questioned that number to the point where we convinced the state to fund another project. They funded another project for us to just specifically look at how much water people are using in their home and what fixture are they using that water from. And so we put out sensors in three communities in rural Alaska to do just that. We measured water use in each one of their fixtures in their home. And we found that, you know, here's a, here's a home um, in a community that they use 231 gallons of water per day. Here's another home in rural Alaska that uses 61 gallons per water, of water per day. Another one that's 85, another that's 136. These are big differences in numbers. And these are in, in communities with, with plumbing. And this does not count the water that from the water plant to the house didn't make it because of bad infrastructure, leaky pipes or things. This is just the water people used in their house. And so when we design for people, it's important to understand that community to communities vary, people person to person varies inside of a community and how we interact with our infrastructure varies. And those things all play a role on how we have to think about designing the next set of infrastructure that we will be using, hopefully for the, into the future. We used to be able to design with a 30 or 50 year design life. Can we do that now in a changing climate? I don't quite know yet, um, I sure hope so, but we're, we're getting closer. And so uh, I, I, 
I'm going to end here because I'd like to strike up a longer discussion at the end and leave uh, the next discussion to Billy. Thank you so much, Dr. Dodson. And I definitely, I think we all appreciate that both you and Dr. Habert keep emphasizing that community input and community needs being met and uh, negotiation and discussion are just the most critical parts of this. And I think it's probably worth us all just remembering that, you know, substandard housing being deployed by the state was very much, you know, the cause of these problems in the first place, as well as the disruption of traditional forms of housing and traditional ways of life. Um, so yeah, this is, we're, we're solving past injustices as we think through these issues, uh, as much as we are addressing current and future challenges. Um, so Doc, uh, Mr. Connor, uh, I will happily turn it over to you now, if you are prepared with your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. I'm gonna come at it from a slightly different direction and I'm going to you know, focus really on the permafrost uh, primarily. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the impacts of permafrost on infrastructure, but I'm also gonna talk about the impact of infrastructure on the permafrost. And if we look at the system, uh, what we really find that it is really a system, it's not a single part of it. And it's really easy for us to try to focus only on the infrastructure or only on the permafrost or only on the climate. Uh, and uh, I think we, by doing that, we sometimes miss what we really need to be focusing on. Um, reality is uh, engineers can only really control the impacts of the infrastructure um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the permafrost, but we also have to account for the climate and it is changing. Uh, we know that it's been changing quite a lot since the 1970s. That's accelerated on us. And so that makes it much more difficult for it to keep up. But I also sat back and I thought about it a, a bit. And I realized that the permafrost really doesn't care where the heat comes from, Just whether it comes from the climate or the infrastructure, it really doesn't. So I, I, I drew up a little schematic here that uh, you see here below. Uh, if we start with the infrastructure, um, the infrastructure is certainly impacted uh, by the climate uh, that we live in, uh, as both Jack and Aaron uh, discussed uh, in their presentations, uh, in everything that we do uh, there. Uh, but, the, you know, we can think about the infrastructure having an impact on the climate. Uh, if uh, it's not uh, efficient in, uh, in its energy use, uh, that has an impact on the on carbon exchange. Uh, and uh, so that uh, it, it creates a cycle there. Uh, the infrastructure also has an impact on the, on the permafrost. Whenever we build uh, infrastructure in general, and we'll talk about this in a moment, it generally has an impact of warming the permafrost. 90% of the time or the or large percentage of the time, the infrastructure is going to warm the permafrost. But as it does so, the permafrost then starts to uh, thaw consolidate or it loses bearing strength. And as a result of that, it then um, comes back and has a, uh, an impact on the performance of our infrastructure. So again, it goes both ways. And then we look at the climate, uh, it, it, that goes back and forth as well. Uh, the climate uh, in, in right now is in the warming transition tra uh, period. And as a result is also adding to the thawing of the permafrost. And as that occurs, it's releasing methane uh, into the air, which also has an impact on the climate. So if you look at this thing, each of these are impacting the other. And I think it's really easy for, for us to look at one or two of these pieces, but in general, we tend not to look at the whole cycle uh, as, as we move through that. To give you some ideas of, of what's going on, I'm going to use Point Lay as a as an example of, uh, of what we're seeing. Uh, about 12 years ago, Point Lay put in an underground uh, utility system that delivered water and wastewater. Uh, this is uh, what's going on right now. Uh, they are getting a lot of leaks. Uh, you can see the movement and the damage as a result of that. And they're spending on the order of $2 million a year trying to make repairs to this system to keep it operating. Uh, out of the 60 homes that originally hooked up to this uh, system um, for the wastewater uh, systems, only 30 are still on the system. So they've lost half of the, half of the uh, systems uh, on that. 
Uh, they are now using uh, tank and haul systems. So basically the wastewater goes into a tank and is then hauled and treated at the treatment facility. And um, that's certainly not a truly desirable uh, situation, but that's the way they're doing it. And they are uh, abandoning much of the uh, water delivery systems and, and rebuilding that as well. Uh, we're also having a large number of connection failures and I've challenged our, our um, senior design students uh, this year to come up with a design uh, for connections to the homes. Uh, you can see that they're leaking uh, and you can imagine what uh, at, during the spring thaw what that might be looking like and as a result of that uh, many of these homes are, are you know really not not that sanitary and uh, causing a, a number of health issues within the community itself. Uh, this is another good case of where uh, the buildings are causing their own uh, issues. Um, these houses, when they were constructed, if you look at those cross bracing, the soil was up to that point in time. Uh, many of these uh, areas, uh, due to uh, a number of different things, uh, and I'll talk about those um, in a bit, but basically uh, the infrastructure is causing um, the uh, Ice wedges, uh, where that uh, falls within the community, these are a lot of high centered poly polygons, causing them to thaw. And we're getting as much as uh, 12 feet of, of thaw consolidation under some of these homes. Unfortunately, the piling embedment depth is only 10 feet. So now we've got piling that are sitting on cribs holding up those houses, and that's not a very good situation. Uh, the North Slope Borough is going in and trying to uh, repair those by adding uh, uh, longer piles and insulating some of those piles and uh, making progress on that. But this is something that happened uh, and it comes from a number of different, uh, and there's a number of different reasons for that. And I'll, I'll chat with you in a, just a few minutes about the details of that. Um, as, in, as of January, uh, the, uh, I had a, a water tank that ruptured and I think primarily, my guess is because they had the uh, thermal siphons that they had put around it to keep that ground frozen had uh, ceased to work. And as a result of that, they lost one third of their winter's uh, water supply. And so they uh, are maybe in a little bit of trouble trying to get water uh, this spring because uh, they pipe it from the river, which is now frozen. And uh, the, the pipes that uh, they bring it in and are not uh, not functioning at this point in time. So it's gonna be a bit of a challenge to them to uh, regain that water uh, as, as they move forward. And then uh, two years ago, uh, they lost their uh, water supply lake uh, because it, uh, a river uh, thawed the ice wedge between the, uh, the lake and the, and the river and the lake drained. And as a result of that, they lost uh, their water supply there. When we're talking about road damage, uh, a number of different things you see on the left-hand side that uh, the, uh, what we call grobbins, uh, that comes from uh, the snow being thrown out there. It insulates the uh, shoulders of the roads. Uh, that in turn melts the permafrost, as you can see on the side slopes there, uh, or the, the back slopes uh, there. And, and this area is rich with uh, ice wedges. And, it's, and we end up with that. Ultimately, that will get into the roadway and uh, our maintenance folks call these hell holes uh, because they take so much effort to repair those once they get up into the driving surface. The center one uh, is uh, on the old Richardson Highway uh, towards Delta from Fairbanks. It's an abandoned piece of road. And you can see where the ice wedge, old ice wedges are crossing the road uh, in there and, uh, you know, you can imagine when the road was active, but maintenance was repairing that is almost daily. We're also starting to see a lot of slope failures as a result of that. This is one up on the on the right uh, photo there, one up on the uh, Dalton Highway uh, next to the uh, uh, Yukon River Bridge uh, that I go. If you look at that whole slope, that's been occurring over and over through the years, but we're starting to see a lot of these uh, uh, slow failures due to uh, thawing of the permafrost and uh, it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem uh, in that respect. So I, I, after a bit of uh, thinking about that and, and how do we bring that all down to a common element, 
I went back to the basics and I looked at the uh, energy equations that govern whether or not the permafrost thaws. And it's really, um, you're looking at the net energy, which is nothing more than the inputs of, uh, due to warming and the uh, extraction of the heat due to, to, uh, to the cooling. If the inputs of warming are greater than the uh, losses due to cooling, you're going to get thawing of the permafrost. And it doesn't matter whether it comes from the infrastructure or whether it comes for climate. There are some significant differences between the two. Uh, infrastructure tends to be net warming uh, from the moment it's built. You can imagine building a house and all of a sudden uh, the, the uh, uh, ground is changed from about minus one or two degrees C uh, and suddenly it's on the order of plus uh, 20 degrees C. Um, and the impacts on uh, so the impacts are on those surface temperatures are much larger and much more rapid than we might see in the climate. But the climate is occurring over time. It is seems to be accelerating at the moment, and uh, we anticipate that continuing at least uh, for the near future. Uh, but it does have a little smaller impact on it because it's, it's occurring slower. Uh, but uh, as uh, Kevin Biela said this morning. Uh, it's really uh, a chronic feature and it's going to continue for now. So we can't ignore it in the engineering process, uh, especially since it's additive. So when you put those things, two things together, uh, it, it, they, they do uh, seem to be uh, additive and, and, and causing things to happen much more rapidly. We are seeing uh, much of our infrastructure failing much more rapidly uh, than we have are used to. And uh, we're, we're seeing that Many of the techniques that we have uh, traditionally used uh, are not working or they're anticipated not to work uh, in, in within the next 25 years or so. So we're going to have to come up with new ideas, uh, new uh, techniques in order to uh, continue building uh, our infrastructure in the North. And that's going to be a challenge for, for all of us. And there's no, no one that's attending this uh, salon today that cannot have input into that. So if we look at the energy balance, there's certainly a number of things, and I'm not going to go into any of these in, in great detail, but we've got the solar input, uh, either direct or, or, or reflected. In the case of this photo here, a lot of this thaw is actually uh, due to uh, reflected energy uh, coming from the houses. We got geothermal input uh, in there, water or advection. advection. Uh, if you want to thaw permafrost, the fastest way to thaw permafrost is to add water. Warm water will go anywhere faster anyway. Um, snow drifts, uh, many of our communities uh, do not account for snow drifts in their planning purpose, for planning purposes. And as a result of that, those snow drifts keep the permafrost, the ground warm in the winter and then uh, let the snow and water uh, get in there in the summertime and cause it. Uh, disturbance of, of vegetation, we've known that since 1895. Uh, when, when Puritan said, if you disturb the, the uh, vegetation, you're guaranteed to end up with thawing permafrost. And the infrastructure itself, either due to conduction or radiation. Um, some of the things that are cooling it, uh, radiation from the surface, evapotranspiration or evaporation, uh, both at convective and conductive and and sometimes the wind uh, will have an impact to that. So the trick is, is to balance, to try to balance those in such a way that we end up with net cooling. Uh, very difficult for us to do that, but we can certainly uh, work towards minimizing uh, that aspect of it. So in summary, uh, I think some of the things that we, we can do and should do, and uh, as both Jack and uh, Aaron indicated, the community is a very much a part of the solution, and uh, I, we need to spend more time talking to them, uh, getting their input, and then coming up with solutions that uh, not only meet their needs, but meet their needs in such a way that uh, allows us to uh, have infrastructure that performs well and, and reduces the cost of that, of that uh, infrastructure. So community planning uh, uh, does need to account for both the impact of the infrastructure and the impact of our climate. Uh, you cannot separate the two. Uh, they must be go hand in hand as we look at this and bring it together and, and apply it in such a way uh, that um, those impacts are, are minimized. Uh, 
we have to design our uh, infrastructure to account uh, for the impact of those surface temperatures. Uh, it's very important, but we also uh, very definitely must account for the changes in our climate and bring those together. And finally, we need to uh, design our structures so that they're tolerant of thawing permafrost. Uh, Jack Hebert talked a little bit about uh, geodesic or putting them on sleds so we can move them around. Uh, we also, uh, the CCHRC building is built on an adjustable foundation. Uh, that's uh, something else that we can do. In Point Lay, uh, we know that about 40 feet down that uh, it's on uh, thaw stable permafrost. So uh, lengthening of those piles to put them in a position where they can be successful. Um, so it really requires um, us to rethink our current approaches, uh, to refine them and, and, and find ways that adapt to uh, what we're seeing. So with that, I think that was my last slide. Hope you're muted, Nick. Unmute. Yep, there we go. Oh, you'd think we would all be really good at that at this point. Um, yes, thank you so much. Yeah, I think uh, pointing out all the different feedbacks and like the fact that these systems are extremely complicated and have a variety of ge kind of geographic distinctions between point source heating and, and the climate. These are all, this is, it is an extremely complex problem to be confronting. Um, and I think you captured that well, so thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to open up the floor for questions. We've already got one in the chat from Christy Buffington. Um, but uh, if anybody wants to voice theirs out loud, please just kind of like uh, notify me or put your hand up and, uh, and we'll call on you. But I'm going to, Christy, did you want to read your own question? Or I can read your question for you. I'm going to take your silence as an <laughs> as a as permission for me to read it. So Christy asks, uh, when surface temperatures increase from infrastructure, how do you distinguish the effects of vegetation disturbance versus thermal conduction from structures? And I think that's generally addressed to all of you, but perhaps Mr. Connor. Okay, you know that's a really good question. I've spent a lot of time and a lot of money and to try to separate each of these. Uh, modes of, of heat transfer into the system. And while we can do it theoretically and mathematically, uh, and we can put sensors in to, to measure, the, measure the, uh, the, the impacts, when it comes to practice, that becomes very difficult to do uh, because it's, uh, they're, they're, they're highly interrelated uh, with each other. But uh, as I say, uh, when we uh, would, when we look at these and we can look at each one of them individually, I can go out on a plot of land, which we did out of, out of Corral, uh, just uh, on the other end of Farmer's Loop many, many, many years ago, and stripped the vegetation off of it and looked at what happened uh, as it thawed and, and put sensors in there and measured that. Dave Esch did another study uh, back in the 70s to confirm that. Uh, but and we can do the same with thermal conduct, uh, conduction. We can put a piling in the ground and put the misters around it and measure that. But when we start combining the two, then it gets much more complex. And the same thing happens when we add water and we add all of these things together. It really becomes very difficult to separate. Did any of the other panelists want to weigh in on, on this or? Uh... We can, we can move on to Hayo's question. Hayo, did you want to ask your question uh, in person? Uh, hey, thanks. Um, great presentations. I was wondering um, whether you see a specific need for climate variables that currently aren't available, right? Because the climate variables typically like air temperature or wind speed were designed not with necessarily some of these Arctic engineering applications in mind. Is this something that you think absolutely needs to be measured or, or needs to be calculated from existing measurements that's currently lacking. That would be really interesting to learn more about. Thanks. Jack, did you want to say something before I jump in? Okay. Um, yeah, that's a really, really good question. In an ideal world, uh, we would put 
all of the instrumentation that we need to design for a site, and that includes solar insulation, uh, air temperatures, ground surface temperatures, all of these things would be wonderful to be able to, to put in there and we put and then, and then put into our surface energy balance equations and come up with the answer. That's not realistic. Uh, there's no way that we can afford to do that and no way that we can afford to do that over a long enough period of time to be meaningful. And so what we do is we look at developing some surrogate information to help us out. Uh, there have been a number of uh, studies that looked at what we call an N value, which converts air temperature to uh, surface uh, surface temperatures. And we, we use those, that as a tool. The unfortunate part about that, that uh, approach is as I look it's great if I don't expect a change in my climate. I'm, I'm basing it on the, on the last period of some number of years. But as I look to the future, the end value make is, is, I'm not sure how good that is. Uh, we do the best we can, we make our best guesses, and, and we move forward. But there's really no good way to, to, to be able to put that together. I'm hoping that uh, that's just where the science folks come in, I think, really could help us as engineers out, is to put the, the, the anticipated climate and the surface energy balance equations together in such a way that you can predict the surface temperature. Uh, if you can get us to the surface temperature, we can take it from there and, and start making um, making using that for our design. So if they, the science folks can, can, can take the climate along with, with all the, the surface energy balance and, and give us an idea what the surface energy balance or the surface temperatures are going to be, uh, you would make a lot of people happy really fast. Go for it, Jack. Oh, we can't hear Jack. you. All right, I'm going to jump in while Jack is trying to figure out his mic. And, uh, Billy, I can't agree with you more. And and I would even say that the the interesting part of it is we did if we think about engineered infrastructure, we need something to design to. We need the end point, which 30 years of the end of design life, what the earth would look like, and we need now. And so and we in understanding what changes in between. And so I, in many ways, I don't care what the, the individual wind or the air temperature or the sun is, or is doing. It's the, the aggregate of those things. And so I see people right now designing to areas in the north of saying, okay, I'm going to design to no permafrost. Well, what does that mean to the design you currently are installing in permafrost? And so I think that, 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 that adaptation to understand what does the world look like that we're designing or installing this infrastructure in? Billy identified it as surface temperature. It might be, again, is, is the ground submerged? Are there things like that that we have to be aware about? Is those physical conditions, if that can be related to, would be super helpful. Still can't hear you, Jack. Dr. Hebert, if you want, sometimes what works is you click on the little arrow on your mute button and test the mic, and that'll reset the mic. You want to give that a shot? Hey, in the meantime, though, I, I, if, I, if I just briefly respond, those, are, those were great answers, and they're really helpful um, because I, I think this issue of designing towards the surface energy balance rather than some arbitrary, you know, surface air temperature or whatever you have is really important because you, it, it, then it's the combination of wind speed, you know, uh, uh, the, the whole turbulent radiative fluxes and, and you have ways to manage those where even under conditions where the surface air temperature and, and a simple approach would indicate that you're thawing out permafrost under your structure or adjacent to your structure 
the energy balance actually tells you no, you're still, there's still a slight net loss of heat that helps mitigate some of the, some of the disturbance you've created. And in my mind, that, that is a real, that might be a really worthwhile, I mean, you've, you're already probably pursuing this, but what's interesting is that the, the uncertainties and in, in actually measuring those residuals are not insignificant. And, and even a few watts per meter squared, if you average over longer periods of time can make a big difference. So that strikes me as something that would be really cool to explore a bit more and, and some type of collaboration between you know, atmospheric scientists or climatologists who are looking at this and, and the engineering community. Yeah, yeah. I, thank you for your comments and, and, and you're absolutely right. The other part that I, I think is really important for us to understand is um, when we design, when engineers design, we, we do take into account risk. That is a very important thing for us to do because, you know, our, our charter is no loss of life or property. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, we, the last thing we want to do is hurt someone. And so we, we establish the risks that we're willing to take and that our clients are willing to take. Uh, in the end, a lot of times we don't make the final decision. It's the client as to how much they're willing to pay uh, for that risk. And we, we, you know, we have to talk to them about the risk of failure or the risk of it's not performing as they would like. So if we can get that kind of input uh, as far as uh, what we might see, what conditions the, the structure is going to perform under, then we can start applying the engineering judgment and the engineering equations that we have to that. So Jack, I think we can hear you again. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, wonderful. I, I have these very expensive headphones that NREL gave me and they'll work for a while and then they quit, um, even if I plug them in. But uh, Hayo, the engine that you have up there at UAF and UAA to develop models to predict short and long-term events um, is so important in the design phase of things. If, if we're looking at a continuation, for instance, of, of these high velocity storms uh, coming predictably year after year, uh, it, it helps inform what we're gonna do moving ahead. So it's not just the temperature of the ground, it's how much snowfall is predicted with these different, different uh, climatic changes or these, these large uh, atmospheric, atmospheric shifts. So we can know what we're getting into, sort of like what Texas is dealing with now in the, in the Southern states with, uh, with the extreme weather events that they're having there, whatever we can prepare for helps us. If we know that, that these winter storms are going to be more consistent and more severe over the next 10 years, the urgency of making uh, decisions uh, becomes more acute. So I had a quick question. I know we're already over time, so you know, feel free to, to address this very cursorily, but uh, I noticed that there was no mention of thermosiphons throughout the conversation and no mention also I've heard several people recently discuss geoengineering possibilities, things like ICE 911 and kind of, con you know, which I find to be very controversial and, and dangerous kind of ideas. So I was wondering if you all kind of, um, how your thinking has evolved in terms of, uh, you know, over the last 15 years, was there a much stronger emphasis on we can maintain the permafrost and we can, we can kind of change the uh, the soil dynamics, uh, or and and has that just faded off in the adapt as the adaptation kind of discourse has um, taken more of a hold? Um, yeah, where does that fit into your into your kind of thinking in the, for the future of the Arctic? Well, that's a really good question because we don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, we 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 have a lot of discussions on where that go where where we're going. Uh, you know. Two of the options that we have, uh, there's a couple others, but two of the main options we have, we can either thaw it or we can keep it frozen. And so we go into a location and we look at it and we have to make a determination uh, whether we're going to do that. One of the others is to avoid it. We can't always do that. Or we can remove it. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. 
but the the point is we we every time we build infrastructure we have that discussion that very discussion now if you go down to thompson drive and you stand there and you look at that uh that's got thermal siphons on the geist road end it's got hairpin thermal siphons under it and if i was just down there the other day and i know they're working because there are stripes in the road that have been thawed they're bringing heat out of the ground and they're thawing the surface of the road so i know they're working and they are so they're cooling they're doing what they need to do you look at the air convection embankments there which is those piles of rocks they're cooling the ground and dr doug gehring uh the uh Dean Emeritus of, of the uh, CEM. It, it's, it's, he's spent the last month looking at that till his eyes hurt. But that, the day that we've been collecting out there is for the last uh, 15 years. And he's finding that, oddly enough, even though we've had warm years recently, that's still cooling. So those systems are still working. Okay. So, but the problem we've got is, is that, are those systems going to be working in 2050? And I've seen we we we, I, we uh, Federal Highway Administration funded a study to look at that, and the projections are that the ACE embankments in Fairbanks probably won't work in 2050. Is that true? Your guess is good as mine, but at least we know to be looking out for it. Uh, the same with the thermal siphons in Fairbanks. The thermal siphons probably won't work in the next 20 or 30 years as far as keeping it frozen. On the North Slope, they probably still will work. Um, so the answer is maybe, and and we we just we have to be thinking about that. And, and to add with Billy, there there's I don't think we consider thermal siphon design a static thing. Um, we're still improving how thermal siphons function, not only in their design at, at the base perspective. But in their overall our operation, ANTHC has put a lot of money into looking at active cooling during the summer so that the ones that have started to fail, they can keep them working longer into the future. And some of them are even using solar. So it's no additional new energy add. It's just converting sun to electricity to then produce something to keep the ground frozen. And so I think we need to think about that our existing infrastructure in that way also, that we don't have to just throw it out and start all over again. There's lots of things we can do to modify our current in installations to make them last a little bit longer. Yeah, and I to add to that just very quickly, one of the things we have to be very careful, careful of is a number of the studies that are trying to estimate the cost of, of the impacts of climate change they assume that the infrastructure is going to be thrown out and, and new is going to be built. And it's not. Uh, as time goes along, uh, we're going to adapt. And the quicker we adapt, the lower the cost is likely to be. And so most of those studies, I think, in my opinion, based on that, um, are, are over overpriced they, they, they the cost is is inflated from what i expect it to really be, really be yeah you know, I, was, I was wondering if the the skis that were being shown as being kind of a scaffolding underneath the houses could be applied to existing houses as well so that's it's interesting to think yeah it's not it's not a wholesale yeah throw it all out and and reinvent the wheel um but uh yeah and also these time horizons are clearly astounding to think in um, and we really can't predict the future. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to, I, I really enjoy this conversation. I think we probably could all hang out for <laughs> hours more, but uh, I'm going to close this up. So I just want to thank our three panelists one more time, uh, Mr. Connor, Dr. Dotson, and Dr. Hebert. Uh, it's been really wonderful. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this panel. Um, yeah, any quick closing words from any of you or um, or shall we, shall we call it a day? I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to, to the discussion. Yep, I agree with Billy. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thanks to all our, our participants. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you for our last one next month. So yes, take care everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.